Hey guys, it's Allie and Jen from Michigan Another Mayhem. Just over a year ago, Allie asked me if I wanted to create a podcast. And we had no idea what we were doing. So luckily, we chose Anchor as our platform. It's a free and there are creation controls that allow you to record and edit your podcast right on your phone. You just have to press a couple buttons. Just a couple buttons. I know. I don't want to do the beep. <laughs> <laughs> Anchor distributes your podcast so it can be heard on other platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It does that for us. It also provides us with the opportunity to make money right away. It's everything you need in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's as easy as that, what we did right there. All right, but next time I get to pick what we do. I know, I want to surprise you. You're super. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Michigan and Other Mayhem, the show about Michigan, murder, mysteries, histories, and other mayhem from around the world. Your hosts are Allie and Jen. Okay, Jen, let's do this thing. Hello, Jen. Hello, Allie. Okay. Hopefully you do better than I do. <laughs> what do you want to talk about today? I haven't had a chance to ask you. I didn't think to ask you when I was talking to you earlier. You you forgot my music. Oh, shit. Hey, guess what, Jen? What? We're going to cue fake podcast music. Da -da 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 -da. Dun -dun. Thank you. I, I need to write that back down. That's how I remembered last time as I had to write it down. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm going to talk about the murder of Jamie Thomas Flowers of Muskegon, Michigan, because, you know, I'm picking on Muskegon yeah. for, the, for a bit. Well, the Muskegon field seems to be ripe for plucking. You know what I mean? It is. And this one's um, an interesting one. Oh, well, it's short. Was... It's short, but it's interesting. Okay. Well, I was looking up another article today. Guess what I saw? Hmm. The Kevin Bacon house where Kevin Bacon was murdered yeah. and cannibalized, it just sold on the market to this some high bidder. And I was like, uh, oh man, do they do they know someone was killed in that house? Or oh, I'm sure they or I'm that's sure why they do. They, it. Yeah, that's probably why. Yeah. I was like, whoa, yeah, I saw it on the side and I was like, I'm gonna tell Jen about that. <laughs> Am yeah, I no, thank the, you. Yeah, right? And the thing I'm going to talk to you today is about a TV show. I did um, Scooby-Doo, and that came out in, like, September of 1969. Well, then another show came out in 1969 that is one of my favorites, and that is Sesame Street. Oh, yeah, I used to like Sesame Street. Oh, I used to fucking love Sesame Street. Oh, that was my jam. And I have some funny things to tell you about Sesame Street. And it actually has a Michigan connection. Dun, dun, oh, wow. Dun. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I brought this shit back around. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? You go ahead and go first. All right, I will. Okay. On May 19, 2019, Jamie, age 50, told her husband, Vashon Flowers, age 46, that their relationship was over. Oh, shit. Their, their daughter stated that. Day before that, Jamie and Vashon had been arguing on and off. At one point, Vashon had choked her mother and slashed her car tires. Holy shit. So not like yelling fighting, but like all out fighting. Yeah. Okay. In the early morning of May 19th, she woke up to the door being kicked in and her mother yelling at Vashon, you know, don't do this. And the daughter called 911, and you could hear gunshots in the background. Oh, fuck. The daughter found her mother with four gunshots to the torso in the laundry room. Oh. Where so was the police, her dad? He wasn't there. He took off? Yep. Oh, are they still looking for him? No. So Vashon turned himself in later that day, oh. stating he heard they were looking for him. He denied shooting Jamie, and then during the trial, the prosecutor had called previous partners who stated he was violent with them, one stating he assaulted her with a butcher knife, Ooh. and then he was convicted as a four-time habitual offender as he had felony convictions for a 1995 carrying and concealed weapon, a 1996 possession with intent 
uh, to deliver controlled substances, 2017 assault with a dangerous weapon, and a felon in possession of firearm. Dang! Was the assault with the dangerous weapon the ex-girlfriend one? Were you um, it didn't say. Okay. He was convicted of first-degree murder for shooting Jamie on January 2020. And there was a news article that stated their final argument. Yeah. That just to say it was done mm -hmm. was over the fact that they had both quit smoking <sighs> recently, and he want he had been drinking and wanted a cigarette. Okay, quitting smoking will make you want to kill another person, but I still do not accept that what he did is okay. Right? <laughs> yeah, as someone who quit smoking about 100 times, yeah, at some point you are willing to kill another person to get to a cigarette. Right. <laughs> You're like, I'll kill you and climb over your dead body for it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. All well, right, what I do you got? Okay, I have Sesame Street, and I got all my info from, like, Wikipedia. This one thing is called Best Life Online. Another mental floss, which seems to be my thing. And another uh, fourth one, which is, like, K102.5, Bobby Guy. All right. Ready? Yeah, it has to do that help me out there with the Michigan connection. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Sesame Street actually started with an idea in 1966. When Joan Gans Cooney and Lloyd Morissette, they wondered if disadvantaged children could benefit from an educational TV show. Because if you remember, like back in the day, there weren't really TV shows for kids. You know, it was all adult shit. So Lloyd was the Carnegie Foundation vice president. And after two years of research, the Carnegie Foundation provided a large grant to the newly created Children's Television Workshop, which I was like, I grew up with that when I was a kid, the television workshop. Mm -hmm. the, Yep, the Ford Foundation and the U.S. federal government and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, they all added their money together for a complete grant, total grant of $8 million, which in today money is $56 million to start Sesame wow. Street. Yeah. So Sesame Street was the first preschool educational TV program to base a show on formative research because they did research to see what's the best way to teach kids through tv so it's the first time we have a tv program based on research i was like holy shit i didn't know it's research i just thought it was like people having a good time right. you know what i mean so it was going to be called one two three avenue b but that is actually a real location in new york and that's the sesame street is supposed to be in new york right so they're like oh we can't have a real place so they changed it to one two three sesame street and in 19 and in 2019 123 Sesame Street, New York, became a real place to honor the show's 50th anniversary. But it's like just a sign. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's still cool. I thought it was still cool, too. But I was like, at first I was like, yeah, is it like on a stoop? Because, you know, they always sit on a stoop. But no, it's just a sign. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, though. I'd still go there and take a picture. So it premiered November 10th, 1969 with Carol Burnett featuring as the first guest star. And Sesame Street had the format of, like, humans and Muppets interacting. And the humans represented different ethnicities and different ages from children to the elderly shop owner, Mr. Hooper. And the first um, highlights for the show were the letter W and the number 2. Really? Yeah. I remember when I was a kid just being like, what's the letter for today? What's the number? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, like, being, like, totally into it. So the show worked not just to educate children, but it also they also used the show to help kids deal with the world around them. And Sesame Street's covered topics like racism. They went over 9-11, death, illnesses like AIDS. And the actor who played Mr. Hooper died in real life in 1983. And the episode that addressed his death aired on Thanksgiving in 1983. And they did that consciously. The network made a conscious decision. Because they wanted the children to be able to watch the show with their parents so they could have emotional support when they find out Mr. Hooper's dead. And I was actually eight years old, and I do remember being sad that he died and talking to my friend Lori about it. Even though we were, you know, eight is a little old for, you know, you're feeling that Sesame Street, you're a little old for it. But I still remember, like, oh, shit, he's really dead, you know, <laughs> being sad. Yeah. Like, oh, no, not Mr. Hooper. Okay, so the first 15 years... Only Big Bird could see Snuffy the Snuffleupagus. 
And the show creators actually begin to worry that they're giving children the idea that adults wouldn't believe them because, you know, Big Bird would be like, oh, Snuffy was right here. And everybody would be like, sure, he was Snuffy, right? So they didn't want kids to think that adults wouldn't believe kids if they had something serious to tell them. So they want kids to still be able to open up to adults and say, like, you know, someone's abusing me or this is happening. And they want kids to know that they will be believed. So they changed the show so that people would start to acknowledge that they can see Snuffy the Snuffleupagus. And I was like, wow, these people are, like, still in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Snuffy the Snuffleupagus actually has a first name. It's not Snuffy. That's his nickname. His real name is Aloysius. Nah. uh -uh. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. So here are some facts about the show. In the first season, Oscar was orange. I was like, what? No way. Yes way. In season two, he turned green after he vacationed at Swamp Mushy Muddy, and he became covered in slime and mold, and he turned green. And so he's been green since then. I was like, he would have looked weird orange. I I think I'm just used to him being green. Yeah. So Cookie Monster is the only monster on Sesame Street to have five fingers. Everybody else has four. And his name isn't Cookie. It's actually Sid. Huh. <laughs> he has, yeah, he has a British cousin named the Biscuit Monster because they call cookies biscuits there. And his counterpart in Nigeria is the Yam Monster, not the Cookie Monster, because they don't really eat cookies in Nigeria. So there's never any, there were never any plans to change Cookie Monster into the Veggie Monster. Do you remember that rumor? No, I don't, but there's oh just God. no way you could change Cookie Monster into a Veggie Monster. Yeah, I, see, I had heard back in the day, they're like, oh, because they're saying, you know, people should eat healthier, and Cookie Monster is encouraging kids to eat sweets, they're going to turn them into the Veggie Monster instead. No, and it's the people that buy the cookies. Right, <laughs> right? Well, that's actually an urban legend. I was like, good to know. The, and Cookie Monster and Ernie are the only two Muppets on the show that are left-handed. Everybody else is right-handed. So Ernie also had the most famous song from the show. Can you guess what it is? What is it? Rubber Ducky. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. Oh, yeah. I actually used to like that song. And Rubber Ducky hit the airwaves and climbed the charts to reach number 16 on the Billboard's Hot 100 singles chart. And, you know, that's the one my boy Casey Kasem used to do. We talked about him in an earlier podcast. Mm Mm-hmm. So it was also nominated for a Grammy in 1970. And it was um, considered, it was, the category it was in was the best recording for children. And the Boston Pops Orchestra classified the rubber ducky as a percussion instrument when they performed the song. Because each thing that you use to make, you know, sounds and music in the orchestra needs to be placed into a group. And so they made it a percussion instrument. Instrument. So... Yeah, the duck, the rubber duck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A few stars on other shows received their start on Sesame Street. So Kermit the Frog, which is Jim Henson's alter ego, first mm-hmm. appeared on Sesame Street. And you know Arnold from Hey Arnold? Did you ever watch that? I know about it. I never really watched it. Okay, I didn't know if Brandon watched it. That He first appeared on Sesame Street in 1990 as a claymation character. And then he later debuted on Nickelodeon in 1996. In his own cartoon. And it's called, Hey Arnold. <laughs> and he has like a football shaped head. Okay, so Afghanistan has its own version of Sesame Street that reduced the roles of the Count and Oscar due to cultural taboos regarding vampirism and garbage. So, yeah. Afghanistan has taboos against garbage and vampires. So the roles, those two characters are minimized. And South Africa's version of Sesame Street has an HIV-positive character named Cammie. Nuh-uh. Uh-huh. And Elmo is the only non-human to testify before Congress when he lobbied for music education. And since the show has been on air for over 50 years, you know, consistently, too, because remember Scooby-Doo went off the air for a couple years? Yeah. Uh, Sesame Street's never been off the air. It has broken Guinness Book World Records. It's won a um, the mo- It's won the most daytime Emmys at 122 awards. It's the most popular children's educational program. It airs in 143 countries. It's in the top five for longest scripted shows on air in the United States at 51 years, and in a few years, it'll be one of the top two shows on air for length of time. 
Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. Are you ready for Michigan's connection? Okay. Okay. You know Gordon and Susan? Gordon had a bald head and a mustache, and Susan is his wife. Do you remember them? They're human actors. Yeah. They, they play a married couple. Okay, so Susan's parents um, were written to be from Michigan, and Gordon's sister moved to Sesame Street after she quit her job as a news reporter in Detroit. Ha-ha. Mm. Yeah, Michigan. There you Martin, go. Yeah. Martin P. Robinson was born in Dearborn, Michigan in 1954, and he became the Muppeteer for Telly. Slimy the Worm. Do you remember Slimy the Worm? He was a yeah. little yellow. And I loved Slimy the Worm. I yeah. thought he was the cutest fucking thing. So he did. He was a Muppeteer for Telly, for Slimy, and for Mrs. Grouch when Oscar's mom would come. Oh, wow. Yeah. And in 1977, the Detroit Tigers had a pitcher named Mark Fidrich. And his nickname was The Bird because he, had a, he was really tall and he had a slightly large nose and it kind of made him look like Big Bird. And in June of 1977, Sports Illustrated featured Mark and Big Bird, Big Bird on the cover together. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. Kermit the Frog came to East Lansing in 2006 to be the Grand Marshal of Michigan State University's homecoming. And he went to Spartan Stadium to watch a football game and honor. Um, and he got an honorary alumni award. Kermit the Frog. Here in Michigan. I, love, I love Kermit the Frog. Yes, I love Kermit the Frog, too. My favorite Muppet, though, is Animal. In yeah, 2010, here's my last fact. Are you ready? Yep. In 2010, Detroit Mayor Dave Bean declared June 22nd as Sesame Street Day. And Elmo came to receive a key to the city. Aww. Elmo was here. Yes. I'm like, how did I not know? <laughs> I yeah. Know you would see Elmo. Yeah, you would think. Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah, well, our kids were about nine at the time, so I bet we had some things going on already. Right. right? <laughs> we were both single parents with nine-year-olds, you know? Yeah, <laughs> things happen. <laughs> That's great. So anything else going on? No, but you'll have to look up the letter people. Uh, which letter people? The one back in, you know, when I was young. Oh, Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah, maybe that has... A, you just have to look it up. Most people that I talk to about the letter people uh -huh. don't even know anything about them. I'm like, they were the coolest thing ever. It was when I was in kindergarten. On um, Sesame Street, there were the letter people? No. Oh, that we, it's just oh, that on, on that same network, I believe it it oh. aired. And it was called the letter people. And you got to look, look it up. Because if you like Sesame Street, you'd like the letter people. Okay, there was a show that I would talk to people about, and nobody knew the name. Nobody even knew what show I was talking about. And one day when I was working at um, St. Joe, the hospital I worked at for about 20 years, um, a coworker, I started to explain it to her, and she goes, oh, yeah, that show is called Hot Fudge. And I was like, what? You know the show and its name? She's like, I loved Hot Fudge. <laughs> so Hot Fudge was a show that had Muppets. And this dude would um, sing and he would play this piano. And it was called Hot Fudge and Tina knew what it was. And I was like, what? Oh, I see. What, what is that weird ass noise? Is... Contact us at anchor or Michigan and other mayhem at gmail.com or on Facebook to join the conversation, listen to the podcast, or correct us when necessary. Rate and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast provider. Bye bye now.